It's time to dig in and discuss the questions on the minds of today's leaders. You are listening to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. This is where we get vulnerable, raw, and authentic about the stuff that really matters. Now, here is your host, Kathleen Reeson. Welcome to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. I am fresh off of vacation and so excited to present today's topic. And I think the reason that I share that I've been on vacation, one is because I'm so excited that I've, I really took this breath of uh, just, just going away for a little bit and going and experiencing a different environment. I think that's so important, especially right now as we're in this space in the world where I think a lot of things are coming together. And for a lot of people, that's great. And for other people, it's not necessarily as cohesive. And so a vacation is a really nice time just to have that reset. And so when we're talking about today's topic, light a fire in your team, it's really, you can think about it from a team perspective or an individual perspective. And teams are really made up of individuals. So we get to light fires in each individual. And that's what's so important. So light a fire in your team today. Now, the way that I titled today's show is really important. Light a fire in your team. Because if you Google light a fire, uh, my team needs to be lit up. You Google all these things about lighting up a team or lighting up an individual. What you'll find is another word that often gets replaced where I put in light a fire in your team. There's a word that often gets put in there. And it is light a fire under your team. Now that may seem like a really small tweak between the word in and under, and yet it's so important. It is the difference between extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. So light a fire in your team is what we're talking about today. We aren't talking about light a fire under your team. Now let's, let's really break down what that means. Okay, light a fire under your team. I'm going to use an example. You guys know I'm a mom. I took my kids on vacation too. So that was really fun. And oftentimes, even while we're on vacation, but any time with my kids, they're still at a place where they are very extrinsically motivated. And I believe that intrinsic motivation, yes, it's something that we have naturally, but it's also something that grows over time. So when you're a kid, extrinsic motivation is definitely... Uh, it, it works. <laughs> it really works. And so extrinsic motivation means I will do something or create something or move forward because of something outside of me. So my salary in an adult would be an extrinsic motivation. And for a child, it might be, hey, if you'd like 10 more minutes of technology time, then would you finish your homework? Hey, if you clean your room, I will let you have dessert. Hey, if you take a shower, then whatever it is. So you're dangling some kind of carrot of desire. But if you're like me, there is no carrot. It's like chocolate. My kids aren't going to do anything for carrots, but they sure will do something for chocolate. <laughs> so, so carrot is really just a think of it as the desire. It is not the actual item that we hang out there because vegetables are often not the, uh, the extrinsically motivating goal that we would like. So especially as children, extrinsic is great, which means that I can light a fire under my kids to get them to move and to evoke some kind of action. But as we grow and get older, the goal is that we switch from an extrinsic motivated to an intrinsic motivated, which means that there are things that just light us up. And because we're lit up, we create, we want to create results. And so oftentimes when we're hiring people, we want to hire people that are intrinsically motivated because if you're intrinsically motivated, you don't need a lot of drive. Now I have had employees and I've had friends that have employees that we often say there's always the, that person that's like the car. So if you want, if you wanted to go from point A to point B in your car, you've got to fill it up with gas. And if you want to go really long distance, like thousands of miles, Every you know, six hours or so, if you're driving straight, you have to fill up your, your gas tank. Well, when you think about that from employees, there's certain types of people where that's the same thing that they require. So they start out the week, you have that pep talk, like this is gonna be a great week, I'm so excited for you. And you really give them that extrinsic motivation. Well, that only lasts for so long, which means that within a few hours or a few days, depending on that person, you gotta go give that extrinsic motivation again. And then, 
that lasts for a shorter period of time, and then you go give it again. And so you're just constantly filling up the gas tank. You're constantly telling them, hey, here's this extrinsic motivation. So sometimes short-term bonuses work that way, where we've got these, these points in times where we're attempting to get people motivated. And so that is lighting a fire under somebody. So I'm going to give them just enough to get them excited to create the result that I want. And, and while that's effective, it's effective very short term. And ultimately, it's a great way to burn people out because they're only going to be as motivated as the bonus that's in front of them, as the carrot. Again, I'm using the word carrot loosely, but they're only as motivated as the carrot in front of them. And so when you're lighting a fire under somebody, you're using extrinsic motivation. But our goal is to move to an intrinsic motivation, which means I'm lighting a fire in them. Now let's talk about what that means. Because lighting a fire in someone means I see something in them that they might not necessarily see in themselves. When you can evoke, meaning you can, you, you're not doing anything, but you're inspiring somebody to act in their best interest and they see that then you are naturally intrinsically motivating them. So you want to light a fire within someone. Now, when you light a fire within lots of someones that work on as a team, then you're lighting a fire in the team or in your team. And so that's your job. So really, as a leader, we're looking at, it's not about the carrot that we're putting out there. Now, are there times where putting a carrot out there is important? Absolutely. But we're really talking about how do we reach in and see the potential in somebody? How do we light that fire within someone? And I'll tell you what, I spent a lot of time in the emotional intelligence world and understanding how we actually do this. But what lights my fire is not the same thing that lights the, ne the person next to me's fire or the person next to them. We all are lit in a different way. And so as the leader, it is my job, your job, the, the, the leader's job, to understand what it is that lights somebody up. Now, I had somebody ask me the other day, it was a brilliant question. My friend, he says to me, Kathleen, what does your ideal day look like? Now, how I answer that question could be very different than how somebody else answers this question. In fact, I got to talk to some of his employees and I know he's asked them this question, but one of them in particular, the way she answered it was, I wanna work my eight to five. I want to cook dinner with my husband at night. And so I want to be free after five and I don't want to have evening meetings and I don't really like to travel that much, but I want to put in my eight to five and I want to work really well in that environment. Now, this question really challenged me when I said, well, what is my ideal day look like? What is it that would light me up? And I know I've lived it, but I really couldn't put the words around it. And so this was a wonderful exercise. I invite you to answer this question for yourself too. But I spent a lot of time really understanding it. What does my ideal day look like? And what I came up with was for me, it's about true flexibility. It means that I don't live in an eight to five world. I don't live in a 40 hour a week world or a 60 hour week or a hundred hour week. I don't live in an hourly world. How I live is results focused. How I live is based on the work that I do is really more critical thinking and decision making. And so it's not hourly. I have my best, my best ideas, my best thoughts come when I'm taking a shower in the morning. Now I'm not going to bill my clients for taking a shower in the morning. I'm not going to say my, my 15 minute shower or however long my shower is, that's going to be passed on. And so as a result of how I work and how I really show up the best, I've created my ability to bill based on a retainers versus hourly because it wouldn't make sense. Now, the lady that comes in eight to five, she can absolutely bill hourly if she wants because that makes sense for how she shows up and what's best for her. But in my world, there aren't hours. I don't live in a PTO world where I say, if my kids, for example, are home for a day and they say, hey, mom, can you take us to the swimming pool? I'm not going to say, hold on, let me check my PTO and see, because that's not the way that I work best. So as a result, I've created an environment with unlimited PTO. 
Now there's dangers to that too, because if you have unlimited PTO, actually what's happening is that people use less PTO than if they had very specific PTO requirements. I was working with another company. They said, in, here at our company, now this is not the, the, main, the main employee, the, the CEO didn't say this, one of the employees said this. He said, you know, it's really frowned upon to take vacation. I mean, they, they say we should take vacation, but it's really hard to. And so an unlimited policy just wouldn't work here because none of us would ever end up taking vacation, but we needed these set dates. So I get that. And here that in a lot of cases, you know, a limited PTO wouldn't work, but for my world and knowing what motivates me, it is, it is really that flexibility to be able to say, I own my schedule and I will show up for what I get to show up to. But if I have open time on my schedule and I'm working on a conceptual task, I we will not find me sitting in front of my computer just to sit in front of my computer. And so because I'm very clear about what is the best day for me, I have built my world around that. Now, as an entrepreneur, I'm also fortunate to be able to build my revenue streams around that as well. So that is a luxury that I have. But a lot of companies, and because this, my friend who is an employer, he was very smart about asking each of his employees this question and saying, well, what really lights you up? What he's really doing is digging in and saying, is it possible for me to create a scenario where I, an environment that lights up each of my employees each day? Is it possible? So I acknowledge him for walking down this experiment to say, could I do this? And am I willing to have one structure for one person, but another structure for another person, even though they play on the same team? Am I willing to add that complexity to my life and my business because it's what's in the best interest of each of the individual team members? So this is a brilliant question that he's asking. And what we're really getting to is that if you want to light a fire in your team, not under your team, but in your team, and you really want to focus on intrinsic motivation, you get to look at each individual and say, what is it that would light them up? And so my friend that asked this question, what is your ideal day, really got me thinking about, well, what does my ideal day look like? And if I stripped away these thoughts of, that everybody else has, so what it has to look like, all the confines, if those are gone, then what is actually left and what do I build with? Am I okay truly lighting up the people around me based on what they need? Now, what often happens is that as the leader, I project my needs onto somebody else. I could easily project my desire to not have this confine or structure of PTO onto somebody else. But in reality, maybe that's what they want. I once had an employee who wanted to go to Europe. She wanted to go on this two year trip, two, two year, two week trip, but she planned it four years in advance. Before we bought this business, she was saving her days. We buy this business and we come in and say, oh, we're gonna have this unlimited PTO. And she was angry. And it took me a while to figure this out. She was angry about the unlimited PTO. And I said, well, what, what is it that's making you so frustrated? What's going on? And she says, well, I've been saving up my days to go to Europe for however long, you know, this point been like two years. She wanted to go two years from now, but she's been saving up her time for two years. I said, okay, cool. Well, you want to go for two weeks to Europe? Awesome. You can go to Europe for two weeks. And I thought, well, this is pretty easy because she wants to go. We've got the time. We'll make it happen. She can go to Europe. But in her mind, she wanted somebody, she wanted to earn those two weeks of vacation and know that she had it banked because she didn't trust, hear this word, she didn't trust that unlimited PTO was really unlimited PTO because of her past experiences that I had nothing to do with. She held PTO as something that she could bank and earn and count on. But I was asking her to live in this ambiguous world of, no, it's cool. If you want to go to Europe for two weeks, go to Europe for two weeks. And I realized that while that worked for me, it didn't work for her. She wanted a very specific set of days that she could earn and accrue. And if she ever left employment, she could take that time with her in the form of money. 
and that doesn't occur to me because that's not how I work. But I can't project my beliefs and what lights me up onto somebody else. So there's so much more to learn. But what I want you to learn from this segment is that we get to light a fire in people, not under people, that's extrinsic motivation, but we get to light a people, light a fire in people, intrinsic motivation. The difference between intrinsic and extrinsic. And Entr- extrinsic, we've got to keep doing it. We've got to keep lighting the fire. But when we can get that intrinsic motivation, we can figure out what really drives the people around us. That's what creates loyalty and retention, which leads to customer satisfaction and profitability. So these are really important things, but it starts with really creating intrinsic motivation. It takes a powerful leader to look inside someone else and ask the questions and really hear what they're saying about what lights them up. We're going to go on a quick break. And when we get back, don't worry, there's more. You're listening to The Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. Talk to you in just a second. Are you enjoying the conversations on The Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspire Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspire Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reason Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. We've been talking all about lighting a fire in your team. Now, there's actually something underneath this as well. The biggest question is, like, sure, we want to light a fire on our team, but let's ask ourselves why. So what is it that we want to create? What are the results that we want to create because we're lighting a fire on our team? And one of the things that I see in the world right now which is the biggest reason that I focus on lighting a fire in myself and in my team is because of speed. Speed, meaning the rate at which we create. Now, I like to move really fast, really, really fast. I talk fast, so I get to remind myself to slow down. Maybe you've heard that. I get to remind myself to pause and to breathe. The power of the pause is really important. And so there are definitely downsides to moving really fast. But here's the thing. This is a true statement that I'm going to say. Okay, so hear this. This is true. my truth. When you move fast, you will fail. When you move fast, you will fail. Now think about that. Do you agree with that statement or not? You can decide on your own. When you move fast, you will fail. That is my truth. And... I'm going to follow that up with who cares and so what? Failure is not a bad thing. Failure is actually a great thing. It doesn't feel great. I mean, nobody likes to fail. It sucks to fail. I have failed a lot in my life. I've also won a lot in my life, but I have failed a lot in my life. And I tend to hang on to my failures because, well, one, they're big lessons, but two, like they don't feel good. But yet, every time you get through a failure, you have a really big win. I was reading uh, some, uh, doing some research before I came onto this show, which actually I do for all, all my shows. I usually just like to see what are some of the other conversations that are happening about the topic. And so when I was looking on today's show, we talk about light a fire in your team. One of the things that came up was about versions. Now, the first version that we put out into the world I, I like to call that your, your crappy first draft or sloppy first draft. So when I was writing my book, 
the very first thing that came out, you never saw this. It was just the first thing that was written was the sloppy first draft, the crappy first draft. Okay. But the thing is your first draft version one in any iteration, new product, new service, whatever you're going to market with, whether people see it or not, version one is, is rarely going to make you money. Version one is going to flop most of the time. I mean, we're talking 99.9% .9 of the time. Version one is going to fall flat on the ground. It may not even get off the ground. Version two is not going to be much better. But version three and version four, that's where you really hit the sweet spot. That's where profitability comes in. But if you never did version one, you couldn't get to version three. And so you've got to have the failure in order to get past that to where the profitability is. And what I see happening is that we are moving at a pace that if we don't have that fire within us. So talk about extrinsic motivation. Let's just say, for example, we're going to launch this new product. And we're saying to our team, let's say we put it based on profitability or even revenue numbers first. Let's just say revenue numbers. We say, we're going to launch this new product. And when we hit $1 million, you'll get 2% of it, whatever it is. I'm just throwing numbers out there, you guys. It's the beauty of this. Okay, so we set this goal. We set this extrinsic goal. We put version one out there. Well, version one is the sloppy rough draft. So we put a revenue goal on it. What if we just put the goal of that it happens? that we put version one out into the world. And that was our goal from an extrinsic perspective because that gets us then to version two, then to version three and version four, that's where our profitability is. And so oftentimes when we use extrinsic motivation, we actually apply it in a way that's not effective. So at first the goal is just to get out there. If we put our goal on a, a revenue goal, for example, we're not really allowing for failure. We want to have companies that embrace failure because oftentimes when the fire starts to dim within us, or even from an extrinsic perspective, just when that fire, that excitement, that joy, it starts to drain, it's because we're not hitting results. We're not creating what we had in mind. We're attached to an outcome for some reason, whether that's our, our bonus or whether it's just what we dreamed that we were, we were attached to what way something was going to look. And then it doesn't happen and our fire gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Failure dims our light. We allow failure to dim our light. And so when we're talking about lighting a fire in your team, we get to first look at a lighting a fire in ourselves. And so what dims our light is failure, but we get to shift how we look at failure because failure is merely a point in the lesson. Failure is going to happen and when we embrace it, and so you've all, you've heard fail fast, but I truly believe it. Because when we're willing to fail fast and say that this is just a normal part of the process, then we move through that and we get to the real goal, real meat. That's so beautiful. Imagine if you had a culture like that at your company. When people pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to get these culture experts to come into their companies and say, how do I get people to move quickly? How do I get people to be excited? And the reality is, good to adopt a culture where failure is okay. Now, if you have too much failure, if, if all you're doing is failing, then you're not actually creating a profit. You can't sustain your company. So that's not gonna work, but there's a middle ground there. I was working with another company and they were talking about how they're pretty safe. So they sit around and they think about what could possibly happen one day, and then they work on an idea and they actually get it out into the world. But by this time, they've lost their first mover advantage because everyone around them has already done the idea. Had they just moved on it in the beginning and been okay that it wasn't perfect, they would have had first mover advantage and they would have gotten through their first version, moved into the second, and the third, and the fourth before their competitors even realized what was going on. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. If you want to light a fire on your team, really congratulate them for moving forward, for being risky. I had somebody say to me the other day, Kathleen, the difference between you and me is your grit. I said, no, gosh, not at all. The difference between you and me is that my risk tolerance is just a little bit higher. 
I'm willing to fail. Hear that. Yes, I'm the one that's holding the, well, I've got a, I'm not holding the microphone, but it's in front of me right now. And maybe you don't have a microphone in front of you in this moment, but it doesn't mean you couldn't. I could put anybody, you're here, here listening. I could put you on this mic. You just reach out to me, I'll put you on the mic. And the whole thought is, the, the question I've got for you right now is when you hear that, what are you thinking? Are you saying, oh gosh, that scares me? Or are you you saying, hold on, what's your email again, Kathleen? I'm going to reach out to you. It's Kathleen at KathleenReason.com. Reach out. If you hear opportunities like that, grab them. The only difference between me and the next person is risk tolerance. Meaning I'm willing to be risky. I'm willing to fail. But that's not something, I didn't just wake up that way. It was just a series of smaller risks that then I was willing to take bigger risks. But that's, that's a season too. Okay? I just went through a really big risky period where it cost me a ton of money. If you've talked to any, any business owner that walked businesses through or crawled or whatever words we want to put on it, we made it through the, the whole COVID experience. I had consumer-based businesses. Now, I have, that's, those aren't my main businesses, but my investments, a lot of them were in consumer-based businesses. Now, walking a consumer-based business through the pandemic was not fun. I don't know a lot of people that said that it was, but hopefully you're one that's saying that it was. And my point of that is I just walked through a really risky period. And so my adversity, my, my risk tolerance is a little bit less in this moment than it would have been three years ago or two years ago even. And so know that your risk tolerance is truly just a season. It's just a period in time. Now, my risk tolerance will increase again. But in this moment, it's not as great as it was. It's still great. It's just not as great as it was. And so that is, that is what we just get to look at. This risk tolerance is just kind of a sliding scale. And where you're at on it is depending on some of these experiences that you've had. So when I was younger, my risk tolerance may have been a little bit lower. But it's grown over time. Now, what makes your risk tolerance greater or smaller? Well, one experience, we've just talked about that. But two, there's a component of safety to it. I grew up in a very privileged experience where I had two parents that loved me and two sisters and I had grandparents and friends and a house and food. And so I had all of the necessities of life and the wants and desires of life. I really didn't want for anything. It wasn't until I was 10 that I really had my first traumatic experience, and that's when my dad had cancer. And so my, my foundation is, is very solid, which means that when that's solid, I can focus on risk tolerance, because what am I really risking? Even today, I can tell you, that, and this is a conversation that I got to be really clear with myself. So uh, I'm going to be incredibly transparent. I normally am, but I'm going to be really transparent. I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. When the pandemic hit and we had some consumer-based businesses, we were in the middle of moving some of those businesses, physical locations. We were in some of our deals with these businesses. There were Two of our businesses were linked to franchises in which my husband and I had franchise agreements on those. One of them, we were going to have to come up with a significant amount of cash in order to continue this business because of the move, the, the, the landlord that we're going to, the property we're going to go into pulled all of the financing. And so in a matter of 24 hours, my husband and I had to figure out, were we willing to invest a significant amount of money into a business that most likely we would never see? And we had just done that for another, another business. So we had just, I'm going to put some numbers to this. We just put a half million into one business and the other business said, Hey, can you come up with another 300 to $400,000 to get this business where we needed to go? And within 24 hours, we got to decide, what do we do? Do we come up with that money knowing that once we create that money, we're probably never going to see that additional dollar of that back, that it's what we get to do to continue this business? Or do we close it? If we close it, we've got franchise agreements that we get to go figure out what to do with. And so in that matter of moments, we got to decide, all right, we're going to close this. And so we did. It was not a fun decision. And then I'll tell you, and here's the piece that I want you to remember, because we talk about lighting a fire. This really dimmed my fire. And I got to figure out how to light it up again because I'm intrinsically motivated. And so think about this. These are some of the conversations maybe you're having them, maybe your employees are having them. So what we did 
is once we decided to close that, we met with our lawyer and said, well, what do we do about these franchise agreements? And you know what our lawyer said in that moment? He says, the only way out of this is bankruptcy because you've personally guaranteed these loans and these agreements. I looked at this lawyer and I'm somebody that's a a pretty big rock. I don't don't usually have a ton of emotion and tears came down my eyes. I said, are you kidding me? I mean, here I am. I'm a former CPA. I've run all these businesses. I'm, I'm, I'm by all means successful. And bankruptcy never would have been in my scope of thought. And he's telling me that the only way through it is bankruptcy. I said, oh my gosh. And I let that sit with my husband. I both had to sit with that for 24 hours, another 24 hours. And I said, oh, gosh, I don't want to go there. Why? I mean, never, why would I have to do that? But it was the only way out of these agreements. So, so I thought. And I got to really be clear with myself that, okay, well, what's the worst thing that happens? If that's the case, like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? And what I decided for my worst thing is that, well, at the time, you know, both my parents were alive. Now my mom has since passed. But I can always, my kids are going to be fine. My parents are going to make sure that they're fine because I had that luxury. I could always go live with them or live with my in-laws or any of our friends. And then I looked outside our house and I saw all these houses around us because where we live, there are lots of houses around us. I said, wow, well, you know what? The only, if I truly didn't have a home and I had no home to go to, there's these homes everywhere. The only thing between me and the roof over, over my kids' heads is my ability to ask. And I realized in that moment that if I was humble enough, it was going to be okay. Now, the beautiful part of that story is there was another opportunity that opened up. We were able to close all that. We didn't have to go down that route. But I got to be face-to-face with that and be willing to go down that route in order to move forward. My sister was just in a job change. And one of the things that she got to face is she had this fear that there wasn't going to be any more change, any more jobs for her. Now, she's a teacher. That was truly not the case. There are plenty of jobs open for her. But I said, okay, so, so her name's Jenny. I said, Jenny, if all else fails, what's your worst? What's your bottom of the barrel job? Like what, if you had nothing else to do, what would you do? She goes, you know, I've always wanted to cut fabric at the fabric store. I could go do that. They pay me. They're always looking for people. So that was her, her like worst case scenario. If she couldn't get something in the professional education sector, she couldn't be a teacher at, at, at a school anywhere. She could always go cut fabric and that would at least provide enough food for her family. She could move in with us. I mean, there's all kinds of options. But we often don't see that. And when we're talking about lighting a fire on your team, it's also understanding how far they're willing to go. For me, it's, it's a pretty long ways, but I've gotten really comfortable with knowing what worst case scenario is. Now, I know that I'll never have to go there because I've set all these protections in place. But if I do, it's okay not going to be the end of the world. And what happens when we realize that it's not going to be the end of the world, our fire gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And that, my friends, is intrinsic motivation. We're going to go on a quick break. And when we get back, there's more. You're listening to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the batteries of leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. Talk to you in just a second. Are you enjoying the conversations on the Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. How wonderful would it be to carry your favorite Inspired Choices Network host with you throughout your day? Well, now you can. Inspired Choices Network now has its very own mobile app. Our free app offers live streaming shows along with thousands of podcasts and TV episodes. Our shows cover a wide variety of topics. Whether you're waking up with us, carrying us through the day, and taking us to bed with you, we're always here for you to enjoy. We're easy to find. Just search for Inspired Choices Network in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, 
Join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. I was reading an article the other day, and it was talking about how we used to acknowledge our employees and how that doesn't always work today in the environment that we're in. And it used to be, you're a great leader if you're walking around and you're patting somebody on the back and saying, hey, thanks for getting this done. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for creating these results. I really appreciate it. So you're walking around and you're physically connecting with your employees and you're acknowledging them. Hey, thanks for bringing this. And, and so that sounds all great. Like, What's wrong with that? We've been saying physically acknowledge your employees is great. Well, one, our employees aren't always physically in front of us. And so, yes, there's like Zoom or GoToMeeting or meetings and you can hop online. You can say, hey, I see you over there. Thanks for being here. Or you can call them up on the phone. You can talk directly. Sure, there's that. But what this article talked about was how many people are really struggling with a lot of stuff in their life right now. They've got a lot of just, just things that are going on in their lives that maybe we didn't have before or, and when I say before, I'm talking like pre-pandemic versus now. They've got a lot more challenges as a whole. What the studies are showing us is that, that life is a little bit more challenging for a large population right now. And so the way to acknowledge has changed. Instead of saying, hey, thanks for creating this result. Good job at the meeting. We get to acknowledge what's going on in their life, which means we get to understand and know what's going on in their life. If you've listened to this, really getting the, the, the theme here of this, comp, of this, this show today, it's really about understanding your people so deeply that you know what's going on. You get to be willing to have those messy conversations. And you don't have to become the therapist for them, but just be aware of what's going on in their lives and what their challenges are. Because when you understand that, when you open up about that and you're the person that, that can receive it, I remember last week we talked about how to be an advisor. So very valuable lesson that we can learn on. Okay, if we know how to be an advisor, how we can listen with our employees, then we're going to understand what's really going on in their lives. And we get to call that forward when we're acknowledging them. So that may sound like, hey, I know you had a really busy week and I acknowledge you being here. And thank you for getting this work done. Thank you for making this a priority because I get that that may not have been so easy for you. Or when they, maybe something doesn't get created the way we want it to, that initial frustration that's created, realizing and giving grace. Now, this is no different. We were on a plane when we were coming back from our vacation this week and it was, it was late on Saturday night. And my middle son, Noah, so he's 11, we're flying on this plane and there's a baby a front, few rows in front of us with his mom. He wasn't by himself, but this little baby is very cute. And we got into the air and my 11 year old goes, oh, this baby is so loud. But the baby wasn't necessarily crying. It did at times, but the baby was really energetic. It was being a baby. The mom was tired. And the words the mom was using to soothe the baby didn't have that effect. And this went on for our entire three-hour flight. By the time we got off the plane, my 11-year-old was like, how does that woman have a baby? And I got to say to my 11-year-old, we get to give that woman grace. We get to understand that she was doing the best that she could. She was actually flying, not just with the baby, but she had a toddler by herself. So she had two seats for the three of them, plus their luggage. That's a lot. Now I had my three boys, but my husband was also with me and they're older. And I remember flying with my kids at that age. I remember one specific plane ride with my oldest and it was 
like 10 30 at night the flight was delayed we were coming in from pacific time now we were on central time all i wanted to do was get home so it, it's like you know, 10 30 11 o'clock at night this my my young my oldest but he was maybe one at the time not even and he was so i was exhausted but he was not and he spent the whole plane ride. Nah, 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 nah. I mean, the lights are out in the cabin. People are attempting to sleep. And here's my child just talking, 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 talking. It wasn't, it wasn't being bad. And I wasn't being bad. I was just over the noise. And I sat there and I'm sure at the time, I was a new parent at the time. I'm sure I sounded like, could you please just be quiet? Just shh, quiet. And there was probably someone around me that had a very similar experience to my 11-year-old. And so I got to say to my 11-year-old, we get to give that person grace. Because it's really easy to be in judgment and point that finger. But I'll tell you what, when we're in judgment and we're not in curiosity, we've talked about this a lot on, on just different shows, really being in curiosity, well, that, that kills somebody's fire and their spirit. You've seen this before. When you are kind to somebody, they are lit up. You're seeing the potential in them. You are, you are fanning their flames. But when you're in judgment, it's like putting that fire out. And so our job is to fan the flames of the people around us. If you want to light a fire in your team, fan their flames. <laughs> your job is to understand what it is that fans their flames. Because for some people, it is saying, wow, I see you. You just, just keep on going. You just let me know how I can support you. But for other people, it might be different. And so your job as the leader is to understand what flames, how they grow. Like what drives those flames? You get to ask curious questions. You get to be observant, use with your eyes, all the senses to understand what is it that gets them excited. I heard the other day too, I had a friend who said, Kathleen, what are the hours that you work best? Okay, really interesting question. I got to be very introspective and say, oh, it's a good question. And I thought about that for a while. Because in my mind, naturally, I'm still programmed to think, okay, if eight, between eight to five, what are the best hours there? But it's not about that. Is saying that we all have 24 hours in a day. And what are your best hours? When are you the most lit up? And I thought about that. And for me, it's from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's it. Now, it doesn't mean I'm not effective at 7 a.m. And it doesn't mean I'm not effective at 4 p.m. It just means that from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., that is when I am on fire. After that, my effectiveness decreases dramatically. Before that, my effectiveness isn't ramped up. So I can still work and be productive, but I, my effectiveness is not as high as it is between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. So then I, I looked into this because I thought, well, gosh, am I unique in that respect? I, maybe, maybe I should learn how to increase my effectiveness. So I did a little research on this. And I found out that Warren Buffett says his effectiveness is from about 10 to 2, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So well, that's close. I picked a four-hour time frame. He picked a four-hour time frame. This is good. Let me learn more. And what I learned was that Warren Buffett says, look, I am hired. And what, what I, my job is, is to make these decisions. And so I don't want to make these decisions when I'm tired. I'm going to come in at my prime. And I'm going to make the decisions based on the information that I have. And so I just need that information by 10 a.m. so I can come in and be on fire. But after two, you're not going to get the best of me. And so then I looked at this from a healthcare perspective and thought, you know, every single time I have been in a relationship with a major surgery. So, so it's not just me having the major surgery, but my dad who just had surgery at the end of February or my husband that's been through multiple different surgeries or any time that we are related into surgeries, I always want to be the first one on the schedule. I don't want to be the third or the fifth or the seventh or the ninth of the, of the, the surgeon's day. I want to be the first one because the surgeon is going to be freshest then. 
if you're the seventh or the eighth one, the surgeon was gonna be a little tired. Do you wanna be the one that the surgeon operates on when they're tired in a complex surgery? I mean, if I'm having something pretty basic done, maybe it's not that big of a deal. But if I'm going in for a complex surgery, put me on the first spot in the day. When my dad had his surgery a few weeks ago, very complex surgery, the surgeon said, I'm clearing the whole day. I don't know how long this is going to take, but you'll be the first one and the only one that day. Okay, so, so surgeons have this mentality. They know when they're freshest. What happens when a surgery that you think is going to take four hours ends up taking 12? Does a surgeon just get to say, I'm out? I don't know, maybe sometimes it's not my field. So if you're a surgeon, you may, you may know this better than me. But I can tell you in business, if I'm freshest between nine and one, what happens when at eight o'clock at night, somebody's asking me to make a decision? Can I do it? Sure. But I know enough about, to my, about myself to know that if I'm going to make the best decision possible, that's not the time for me to make it because my fire is not as bright at eight o'clock at night as it is at 9 a.m. in the morning. And so when you know what this window is for you and when you know what it is for your team members, then you can apply that to fan their flames. You can apply it to figure out when the most effective time to get work done is when you want to create the biggest results. So you want to increase your speed, know your employees, know what fans their flames. We're going to go on a quick break. And when we get back, we will wrap all of this up. You're listening to the Kathleen Reeson show, pushing the boundaries of leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. I'm your host, Kathleen Reeson, and I'll talk to you here in just a second. Are you enjoying the conversations on the Kathleen Reeson show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership here at Inspired Choices Network. Today, we've been talking all about light a fire in your team. Emphasis on in your team, not under your team. Under is using extrinsic motivation. And what we've been talking about today is in your team. In means intrinsic. And what you get to think about is what is it that really lights their fire? What fans their flames? Because that's your job is to understand that and then just be the person that fans the flame, that keeps them going, that pours into them in the way that they can receive it. Not in a way that you believe is best for them, but in a way that they can receive it. Now, we talked about the sloppy first drafts. And how you got to just get off center. You got to get the first draft into the world. That's not going to be profitable. You got to be, you're probably going to fail on it. And that's okay. Because moving quickly means you fail. And that's okay. Because our real profitability, our sweet spot happens in the third or fourth iteration. When we know that, we know that we just got to get the first out there. If we're going to motivate a team, Motivate them on just getting it out there. And as we develop intrinsic motivation, it's not something that we're necessarily born with. It's something that we develop over time. So with kids, we're using a lot more external or motivation. We are lighting that fire under them. But as they get older, and I've even seen this with my teenager. So he's 13 and I'm seeing some of that extrinsic motivation. We went to Dave and Buster's. So if you guys, you know what Dave and Buster's is, it's, a, it's an arcade and they get these little tickets. It's all digital now. So it looks like a little credit card and they put their points on there. Now my nine and my 11 year old, we gave them each $15 on their cards to go play games. My nine and 11 year old, they were so excited to redeem their points. My 11 year old had 400 points and he had enough to get this stretchy pig. It's like this little pig, but you can stretch it out to 
uh, where it'd be like a foot long. And then you can make it pretty fat and you can move it all around. He was very excited about this pick. It's 400 tickets and he had 400. My nine-year-old, he didn't have 400 tickets. He only had 284. There was a $2 difference between 284 tickets and 400 tickets, meaning that we could pay the difference. So my husband, he says, I will pay the difference. Now you have to pay me back, but you're, you can get this pig. And so my nine-year-old says, absolutely. You, I will pay you the $2. Can you just front me the money so I can get my pig? No problem. Now my 13-year-old is eyeing these pigs. He's thinking these are pretty cool. And we said, well, this says, those, are, those are exciting pigs. But he, he has 600 tickets. So it's enough to get one pig, but not enough to get some of these other things that he was really interested in. And he knows that at home, he has another David Buster's card that's got like 400 tickets on it. So together he has a thousand tickets. The challenge is he doesn't have the 400 ticket card with him. So he doesn't necessarily know what he wants, but he knows like, nah, I'm going to save, start saving my tickets. We said, well, there's David Buster's all around. There's one in Chicago, one in Kansas City, one in Omaha. And guess what? In a few weeks, we're going to Kansas City. We're going to Omaha. We're going to Chicago. So you're going to have plenty of opportunities to earn more tickets. It's just that you're not going to get the instant gratification of a pig or some other tchotchke today to take home with you. And you know what happened? My 13-year-old, he says, okay, I'll wait. And we left David Buster's and he did not get a prize. He had his token there, his his little card that he's saving for his next trip when he can take both of them. And maybe he'll get a tchotchke there and maybe not. But instant gratification, that is a form of extrinsic motivation. And I'm seeing that in my 13-year-old and starting to change into this delayed gratification because it's about what's fanning his flame and having the conversation that if there's something bigger that you want, you can save for it. And so he's starting to learn these concepts. So I truly believe that intrinsic motivation grows over time, but it's about understanding what's important to him. And he's already gotten a lot of those tchotchke items. He was the kid that would have bought the pig two years ago, probably even two months ago. But I'm starting to see a change in him in understanding what really drives him and how he can really save and think about what he wants in the long term. And those are the conversations that as, as a leader, in his world, I get to encourage those and fan that flame. And that's what I'm asking you to do with your employees, to look around and say, what would light a fire in them? And look at them as individuals and as a team and collectively. Now, next week, we've got another amazing show. And I'm very excited to tell you about it. It's what it takes to lead a disruption in the marketplace. Whew, disruption in this marketplace. You're either disrupting the marketplace right now or you're going out of business. I say that so bluntly because it's the truth. We are in a constant state of disruption. You could replace complexity with disruption and we are either working in a complex environment or we're going out of business. And so this is the world that we've created. This is the marketplace that we're in. We're either disrupting it or we're not. And if we're not, we're going stagnant because our competitors are disrupting it. So how do you lead in a disruptive environment that's constantly changing because as we've witnessed, we've been in disruption for the last few years. And now remember at the beginning of this, I said, there is a time and a place where a lot of us are, are ready for that. Like just that little vacation, taking that little break. We maybe put it on hold for a while. And it's so great to give ourselves that space because if you're constantly leaning in a space of disruption, we've got to remember that we also get to fan our own flame and we get to be the example and give ourselves some space to rest. So we're going to talk all next week about what it takes to lead a disruption in the marketplace. There's actually a four steps to disruption, and I'll talk about those. It's one of my favorite things to talk about when we're talking about disruption. But we'll talk about what, it, what does it really mean, disruption? What really is that? And then how do, we, how do we lead when we're constantly in a space of movement? So that's what you can look forward to next week. But what I really want you to take away from this week's show is the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And that fanning someone's flame, we get to create it intrinsically, but know that not everybody's there yet. So you may have some employees that are focused on extrinsic motivation and that's fine, but understand your employees so well and create a culture where it's okay to fail. Celebrate failure, acknowledge failure, fail yourself. And be transparent about it because when you do that, that's when you create incredibly innovative companies. That's a fun place to play. So if you have any questions about this, reach out to me, Kathleen at KathleenReason.com. I thank you so much for being on the show with me today. I will see you next week. Bye. 
Thank you for listening to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. Kathleen Reeson will return next Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Central, 9 a.m. Mountain, and 8 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Have a great week.